Well, maybe you've seen us pastors around here the past few days flying up there. We will be ending on time because we have a show to do this afternoon. Just want you to know. Hey, it's good to see you. And I know it's a big vacation weekend. Uh, I'm just glad you're here. We just look forward to this every week. And it just is so great to celebrate together and uh, sing to the Lord and enjoy um, all that he's done for us together. Today, I just want to invite you, um, grab your copy of the scriptures or your iPod or iPad or iPhone or whatever you have, just um, get to the scriptures one way or another, and we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew. It's the very first book of the New Testament, Matthew in chapter 13, and then grab your East Bay Weekly and flip it over to the back because we have some study notes to work through together as well, and uh, we're going to be in an exciting chapter of scripture here this morning with a couple small parables from Jesus Last week, we were in Matthew 18, and you know, we need to ask this question, and we have to answer it well. Why do we do things the way we do things? Some people say, why, why do you have ministry the way that we have it? Why the music the way we have it? Why the dress? Why this styling of things? And, and we've identified a few targets that Jesus wants us to identify in ministry. And in Matthew 18, we talked about last week, those targets are, and he laid it right out, they are children. They're the next generation. And we talked about it, 70%, folks, as serious as anything, 70% of our young people walk away from Jesus Christ by the time they're 19. And if that doesn't break your heart. And we target children. We target youth. We target the weak. The Bible says those who have the, the potential to stumble by not belonging or by not being embraced or not feeling this is for them, we target those people and we target the wanderers. And Jesus works right into this text in Matthew 18 last week. And he says, you know, what, what shepherd if he has 100 sheep and 99 are in the fold and one wanders away... Which, which shepherd doesn't go after him? He does. Because the 99 are safe. And he doesn't target the 99 as much as he targets the one that leads. And we've been developing this mentality for the last year. It's not about us. If we're part of the 99, I'm a part of the 99 gang. It's not about me. I don't care about me as much anymore. I care about my kids. I care about the next generation. I care about the weak. I care about the wanderers. They're the ones that we need to grasp. And grab just like the shepherd's heart of Jesus Christ who came after us when we were wandering and we were weak and we do the same for others. That's why we do what we do. Today we're in Matthew chapter 18 or in Matthew chapter 13, just a few verses, verses 31 through 33. And, and today we're talking about being all in for a sure thing, being all in for a sure thing. And I love this passage of scripture I hope you're there with me. I'm just going to read those first few verses, and then we're going to talk about it, and, um, and, and I actually have additional time today, just a short chunk of time for text message questions. What we talk about today may raise some thoughts in your mind, and if you have a thought, if you have a question that's about what we're discussing, there's your number right there, that 231 number to text your question into and we will do our very best to answer it a little bit later on. So here's these few verses from Matthew chapter 13, verses 31, starting right there, and we're going to work down through verse 33. Here we go. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field, and though it is the smallest of all seeds... Yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. And he told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast or leaven that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked through all the dough. Jesus talked to them in parables. And today we talk about the reality that we are all in 
with the focus of Jesus, and we're all in with the focus of Jesus, God grows things. God starts things out small and they get big. Now, I want to give you an illustration of what starts out small and ends up big. You. I don't know if you realize how small you are when you started. You were microscopic. You were minuscule. You were undetectable to the human eye. No one knew you were even there at the time. That's how tiny, tiny, tiny you were to begin with. And when that first fertilized cell of yours was there, at that moment, and catch this, at that moment it held a special individual code that specifically identified you and only you. No one else has your code on the entire globe. It is called, and I have been practicing this for this very moment, And I hope I can say it well. Deoxyribonucleic acid. Thank you. Thank you. Now you know why they call it DNA. It is placed in the nucleus of every tiny cell that you have in your body. It it is who you are. No one else has that DNA, only you. And it's so specific, it's been used to solve crimes, to identify people, to look for family groups. That's how specific it is about you. And I don't know if you know this or not, but in every cell of your body, this tightly, tiny wound DNA is in there. And I don't know if you realize that you have in you 30 7.2 trillion cells in your body. I got bored the other day and counted mine. (laughs) And if you go into each cell and you extract the DNA and you unwind it and you put them end to end, you ready for this? There is enough DNA code in you to go to the moon and back. This is going to blow your mind 150,000 times. That's how special and individual each one of us has been created by an almighty God. We started tiny. And how do you know God's in it? I I just, you know, look at yourself and look in the mirror and realize we didn't end tiny. Some of us are still growing by the grace of God, amen? (laughs) When God's in stuff, it grows. When God's behind something, it flourishes. And so today, um, we have just an excellent visual an illustration that Jesus gives of something that grows, and um, I am so excited for this analogy here. Here's how it works. At this point in time, the order of the Pharisees was the primary religion of that day. This was the thing that seemed established that people looked at and said, you know, the Pharisaical religion, that is what is established. That is something that we can look at. And here's Jesus, new on the scene, with these people, with 12 disciples behind him. And he's talking about this great kingdom of heaven. Well, they can look at it and say, you know what? It's just you. It's just you and these 12 guys who really aren't very educated. Like, that is the kingdom of heaven? This is a big deal? And he says, you know what? It may start out small, but it doesn't stay that way. You have your East Bay Weekly. Here's some blanks for us to fill in and work through together. I want us to grasp this, to feel it, to experience it. Number one, the DNA of God's kingdom contains growth. It contains growth, and here's this mustard seed. 
And here's your next blank. It starts out small. He calls it the least of the seeds, the smallest of the seeds. And it may not have been the tiniest of all seeds, but certainly of the primary ones that they would have used in that day, in the vegetable seeds, it would have been the smallest, the most insignificant one. And just think about it for a moment. How small was the kingdom of heaven when it all started out? doesn't get much smaller than this. Where was Jesus born? I'll give you a little hint. A little town of? Okay, I know it doesn't feel like Christmas right now, but just follow me here for a moment. Oh, little town. Micah 5, 2 says, Oh, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are smallest among the clans of Judah, out of you will rise this one this ruler of all this one of old and you remember who jesus was born from from this young virgin teenage girl and so you have bethlehem and you have mary and then here's joseph who really wasn't a big namer in his day he wasn't wealthy he wasn't renowned he was a tradesman. He was a woodworker. Then not only was Jesus born in Bethlehem, he was born in a cattle stall. He lived in a tiny town of Nazareth. The 12 disciples were mostly uneducated, nothing special about them. And if you remember, even people around them would say, you know, who is this guy, Jesus? I mean, we know his parents. What's the big deal? And Jesus is saying, okay, I know it can start small. But it's not where it starts, it's how it ends. And, and so he says, you know what, it starts small like the mustard seed. Here's your next blank on your East Bay Weekly. It grows to be greater than all the plants of the field. I just want to give you um, some visual here this morning of what we're talking about. Here's, here's the mustard seeds. You notice on the screen here and how tiny, minuscule they are put together. Now catch this out. Here's how they grow. Look at the next slide here. In, in a field, all of a sudden you see them taking root and they are growing. These plants get to be easily six to nine feet tall. And as you see, they're structured so close together and they, they weave themselves in each other so that they have um, a really great structure. Some of them get out of control and get to be so big. Wait till you see this next one. This one kind of got a little bit out of control, and you see how huge it can get. And here's the thing with, with the mustard seed plant. They contain so many seeds. They just keep dropping seeds, and those seeds keep growing and they keep coming through, and these, these things can get out of control and really create a tremendous structure. And the beauty of it all is not only about the plant and not only about what can be harvested from it, but for the birds and everything around, they find a home there. They can come in and nest there. And so Jesus says, guys, I know it's starting small. I know it may not look like a lot. But God is in this, and when God is in something, it grows. And there's no big surprise. Jesus talks about growth all through his time. In fact, um, just a little bit earlier in Matthew 13, he talks about casting these seeds, and they yield 30 60 100 times a harvest and what they are those are pretty good numbers if you're an investor he talks about the harvest being plentiful he talks about i have ordained that you bear much fruit he talks about these guys that did investments and they doubled everything they put in and then in Acts 16 when the church started he says you know right off the bat bam it went from 12 guys to 3,000 people in one day. 
And God's saying here, it may start small, but it gets big in a hurry when God's in it. Growth is a sign of God's working. I've never had anyone see something dying and fledging and weak and people say, wow, that's God at work right there. It's not. So I know it's warm. It's even warmer out there. But I want you to think about something amazing. The church is growing at exponential rates today. You realize that? Let me tell you this, in China, in China, let me, let me rephrase that, in communist China, 30 years ago there were 18 million believed believers in communist China, 18 million. Today, it is believed there are 234 million people believers in China. That's crazy. You want to know another crazy thing? Demographers believe that today, this morning in China, there are more people worshiping Jesus Christ today than in the United States of America today in churches. Africa. Africa is exploding they have seen a 51% increase in the body of Christ in the last 15 years alone. And I don't know if you realize what that average, that average is out to 33,000 people coming to Christ or being born into a Christian family each day. That's insane. Totaling over 500 million believers 500 million believers. You realize the population of the United States of America is 325 million? They have more believers there than we do people. And we're the ones sending missionaries to Africa? I'm wondering when the days come, some people from Africa are going to show up here and say, you know what, we want to tell you folks about Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that be something? South America is seeing tremendous growth for the gospel. Even places like Nigeria and Sudan that are going through intense persecution from the Muslim world are exploding. And, and you kind of get the idea that the inherited norm for God's kingdom is growth. When God's in something, when his power is in it, bam, it's going to do something and it's going to light up. Things are going to happen and hence, Jesus moves into the second analogy. You saw that one down in verse 33. And he uses this analogy of the kingdom of heaven is like leaven or yeast. Now, I like this. Finally, a good analogy in the Bible for leaven. All the other analogies liken leaven to sin. And it is so true how sin in our life can grow beyond anything we'd ever want it to be. But it also is in a good sense used here that the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. You put a little bit, and here it mentions, uh, it starts out small, leaven, little tiny granules. It doesn't take too much. And here's your next blank there. It yields great growth. Here they mention 60 pounds or three measures of, meals, uh, of meal. With a little leaven, we'll end up feeding over 100 people full meals for a day. But we heard about China. We heard about Africa. We heard about South America and Sudan and Nigeria. Are you sitting down for a moment? Guess what nation of our globe has one of the worst growth rates for Christianity? The USA, also known as us, a. It's us. You ready? It's estimated 
And I'm not talking about all other kinds of churches. I'm talking about our kind of church, churches that believe like we do, very similar. 65 to 70% of churches that believe like us are either plateaued or declining. Here's, here's some of the crazy thing is. I had always heard 80%. And I, I think I know how they came to that number. 80% are either plateaued or declining. So I had always heard that. And I, I looked up online. I'm trying to do a little bit of research. So I've worked through this. And so I stumbled across this article by Tom Rayner, who's a great uh, demographer and worker within uh, the Southern Baptist Convention studying statistics. And so he, he, he comes out in his article and he says, good news, it's not 80%. It's 65 to 70%. I thought, good news? That's good news? I thought, that's like going to your doctor and he says, you know what, I've got great news. You don't have four weeks to live, you have five. Isn't that great? And that's horrible news. The United States is hurting. And I got wondering, why? Why? And I've heard every excuse in the book. I remember I I talked about this in my previous ministry, and I asked some people, why do you think the church in America is hurting? (coughs) And and one person said, well, it's the end times. I'm like, well, help help me figure this out. So it's the end times in America, but not in Africa? What kind, of, you know, what kind of theology is that? It's the end times here, but not there? Remember one person said, well, I talked, to a, I talked to a pastor friend, and he was a little upset because things weren't happening in his ministry. And he took a little jab at me, and he says, well, Brian, I tell you why my church isn't growing. I'm serious. He goes, because I really preach the word. I, I want to ask him, let me see your Bible. You know, start. what are you talking about? I didn't realize that the preaching of the gospel is a deterrent to people coming to Christ. Really? Thanks for letting me vent for a moment. That was therapeutic. What? I always thought, Romans 1.16, that the that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation, not, well, I really preach it. That's why no one accepts it. <sighs> anyway, sorry. I've heard some people say, well, you know, we just don't have time. I've even um, heard people say, you know, the reason why it's not growing, I, I like the size we are. Crowds scare me. I had some people say that. I, I always like to tell people, if crowds scare you, you are going to have a real problem in heaven. You know, I had a guy in my previous ministry, he sat all the way down front. Crowds scared him half to death. He did not, if he sat in the back, he would have he had a nervous breakdown. He couldn't look at them, so he kind of sat all the way down front, um, understanding that, being in the back would have been a problem for him. And obviously no one here struggles with that problem at all. When God's in something, it doesn't stay the same. When God's behind it, it doesn't die. In fact, when God's behind it, it grows. I want to give you the last one, and then it's time for questions. Here's number two. I love this about the kingdom of heaven. The DNA of God's kingdom is, and here's your blank, broad. It's broad. It mentions that there's this field, and the mustard seeds are planted, and they grow up to these huge plants. And so then there's birds that were not in the field. Okay, they didn't live there. There was nothing to live in. But these plants grew, and then these birds from all over the place would come. Birds that were not native to the field, because in that day, the primary ethnic field that he would have been talking to would have been Jewish people. 
And he's saying, you know, there's going to be people from all over the place coming in this field and making their nest in this field. And I love this thought. Just think about it. There are people worshiping today, worshiping Jesus Christ as Lord, wearing grass skirts. Just think about it. There are people today that meet in facilities that have no windows and they come on dirt roads and walk for miles around. All a part of the kingdom of God. There are people today that are different colors and languages than you and me and celebrating Jesus Christ and all that he's done. And that's how big these plants are that they are now taking in birds from all across the globe and they perch here and they found their home here in the kingdom of heaven even though they may not all look the same. But they believe in the one person, the God of the kingdom of heaven. They believe in Jesus, that he died on the cross for their sin and they found a place in this plant, in the mustard plant. God's kingdom, his DNA is growth. His DNA is broad where things come from afar. And I'm kind of wondering what's going on in your mind. I'm hoping something is going on in your mind this morning about this subject. And I'm hoping we got some tough questions to answer because this is something really important for us to think about. Do we have any text message questions? Let's talk about this for a few moments, and then I have a few thoughts to end up with. Um, uh, here we go. Question number one. Why do you think is the American church failing to grow? Thank you to whoever asked that. Um, I don't think there's just one answer. Are you ready for me to make trouble here this morning? Okay. I think there's a number of answers. I, I believe one, one answer, some churches have given up the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I will say shame, shame, shame. Why worship Jesus apart from this beautiful gospel that he's given to us? Some churches don't preach the gospel. Some churches have given up on the Bible. It has become a more political organization. And, and that's not our mission, gang. Our mission's more and better disciples. And so I'm going to say that's one, that's one big reason why some churches are failing to grow. And some of the main, <coughs> the biggest decline rates are from ministries that have given up the gospel of Jesus. Some other um, thoughts that I have... Um, some churches have lost their mission. So our mission is more, okay, more and better, more and better disciples, flat out. If it doesn't make more, if it doesn't make better, it's not on mission. And we need to think about sending it out to pasture or changing it so that it does stay on mission. And some churches have lost their mission. Some churches, their mission is just to redo last year which was a redo of the year before and a redo of the year before and a redo of the year before and if you try to disrupt the redo you're in deep trouble um some churches struggle with sentimentalism i'm just shooting from the hip here so um but this is one of my favorite questions i've ever answered so God bless the person that sent this in. Some churches struggle with sentimentalism. I, I remember I was at a church in Ohio for um, three years as a youth pastor, and they had a gorgeous auditorium, something like this, um, and it even had a balcony, something like this. And they outgrew it, and they decided to build a larger auditorium that seated about 1,300 people. And they turned this auditorium into our youth room. I was in love. Do you know what this looks like, folks? This looks like a baseball stadium right here. And we had, man, we played wiffle ball. And if you hit it in the balcony, it was an automatic home run. If you foul tipped and it went in the baptistry, you were out. 
it was so awesome. We brought in basketball hoops, and the kids would jump off the wall and go up and dunk, and we're like, this is awesome. And I remember some people saying, this is not awesome. And one, one guy pulled me aside and he says, you know what? We walked down this aisle with my daughter for her to get married. And now that's your way to the pitcher's mound. One guy says, and my kids were baptized up there. And now that's a foul tip and you're out. Sentimentalism. Some people struggle with that. Oh, let me see if I can think of a few things while this question's here. Um, distraction. Can I, just, can I just point out, I think the American church is extremely distracted. And I'm not merely talking about the church corporate. I'm talking about individuals within it. Like, this church will never be better than the people that are in it. I think our people are extremely distracted. With everything else in life, that our, the church's mission might be more and better, but is that my mission? That makes sense? Until it's my, every one of our individual mission to make more and better, then we're stifled in our development for God's kingdom. I think that's another reason why um, the church uh, struggles. Okay. Let's move on to the next because I'm, I'm actually, I made a vow to finish early. What's the laughing for? Did someone laugh? Did someone? Okay, maybe that was funny. Okay. Uh, what's, is there a point when a church is too big? Oh, good question. Is there a point when a church is too big? Um, my answer to that, no. How's that for a good answer, huh? I, there is a point when a church is too big for a pastor-centered model. The pastor can't do it all. The churches get to a certain place and we are past it. Guess who needs to take care of the body? The body. Church people need to take care of church people. And I really believe, as we've been talking about, it's coming. It's coming in a larger way. We want everybody to be involved in a small group. We want 100% participation where everyone is cared for in the church and they are a part of caring for someone else too. And that's what small group ministry is about. But you know, we are far past the point where, um, where the pastor can take care of the whole church or even four pastors or even four pastors in a group of elders. We need the body and that's extremely biblical to step in. But is there a point when the church is too big? No. And I'll tell you... Um, I know, I know so much of this will require discussion with our church leaders and discussion with you, but you know, if, if this is July 1st, one of our worst attended Sundays, and we're not really in bad shape at all, we're coming to the point where we'll probably need to think about even a second service here on Sunday morning. Uh, last week we had... 577 people in our parking lot was jammed. And that's a good problem, amen? It's a good problem. But you know, we're going to have to probably start thinking about how do we allow for growth? Because we're not going to say, you know what? Put a sign up there, no vacancy, you know, no room in the end. Thank you for trying. Come again next week and see if you can come. We can't do that. And so we need to open this place up and say, you know, how can we allow for more and better? And one way is two services. And I know some people, I'm just rambling here, excuse me. But some people will say, we don't want two services because it's like having two separate churches. And I understand. We already have, we have the balcony, folks. It's almost like two churches this morning, you know? <laughs> we don't even know who's up there, like, you know? And they like it that way, don't they? <laughs> I know. You know, I've, I've greeted some people. I'm like, hey, how long have you been here? You know, a year. I'm like, oh, I'm in the balcony. Well, that settles that one, <laughs> you know. So, you know, we, but we do. We're going to need to start thinking about this. Down the road, one way or another, how do we allow for, for this thing to expand? That's something we're going to have to think about. And then if that gets too much, then what are we going to think about? Well, sometimes... We could think about a service at another time, like on a Saturday night. I don't know, just thinking out loud. 
Or sometimes churches think about, let's start to target some areas outside of here and do some plants. Because you, I don't know if you realize, northern Michigan, there are pockets of growing, vibrant ministries, and then there are dead zones. Oh, and it is dead, dead. One more question, then we're done. Birds from afar, how do we explain the lack of diversity in many American churches? Oh, boy. I really believe churches need to look like their communities. Um, I may not sound extremely politically correct here this morning with my terminology. Um, my first ministry in Ohio is interesting. They built this gorgeous facility, and then over the period of the next number of years, the housing around it actually, it, um, it wasn't as white as what it was to begin with. In fact, many other uh, ethnicities were coming in and, and different cultural expressions, and so there was a number of black people coming in and Hispanics coming in, and I'm telling you, and I always cringe with this, None of them came to our church. Zero. And I just kept, why? Like they are, our, there's Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Like there are Jerusalem. Whoop, we just went on to Samaria, you know? We just went and pulled the higher affluent white people, pilfered them from the community, and we didn't really connect with who we were. And I really believe that ministries need to reflect their community. I realize there's not as much diversity in northern Michigan ethnically, but as much as there is, we probably should reflect it, target it. It might mean we need to adjust some of what we do. When I was in New York, we, we hired a black worship pastor. And I'm telling you, woo! That helped upstate New York, man. And, and it connected culturally with some other people in our, in our region. And, and we might need to think outside of just establishing a white American church. I always cringe when I see even missionaries get sent over like to Africa and back come the pictures as they, you know, hey, here's our pictures. And it just looks like white American church in Africa. I'm thinking, I didn't realize they were just like us with, and they're not. Like, why don't you reach Africans with African stuff and not make them be white American Michiganders? How do we explain lack of diversity? I really think American churches haven't really thought about reaching their community for who they are. Last question. That, that, we're all set with those. Great questions. Thank you for participating. Let me give these to you. Three truths to take home. Number one, these are blanks there. I want to give these. These are so important. Three, these are action items. They're not merely truths. Gang, we got to do these. We've got to do them. Realize that God's kingdom is the surest investment you'll ever make. And so you know what that means we need to do? We need to invest. If God says my kingdom is like a mustard seed and it gets huge, that sounds like something I can invest in. You're not going to lose. If you jump into God's kingdom and you say, I'm going to invest my time, my talents, I'm going to invest my resources, my abilities, whatever it may be, I'm going to invest. Let me just tell you straight up, you will not lose because God will take your investment and he will grow it flat out and so i encourage every one of us to be thinking that this is the surest thing you want to be part of something great something that grows jesus said i will build my church and guess what the gates of hell cannot hold it back it's gonna happen be all in on the church it is the surest investment it's two thousand years and going strong and it will only get better and better until Jesus Christ comes back. It's the surest investment. Be all in on it. Here's number two. And I am so serious about this. All of us need to be in on this. If the church isn't growing, sound the alarm. 
This should concern us greatly. And I'm telling you this, this is accountability for me and for our entire ministry. If the baptistry grows dust in it, sound the alarm. If no one comes to Christ around here, sound the alarm. Someone needs to break the glass and pull the handle and say, if we're not making more and better, something has to happen. It's not a fault of the gospel. It's not a fault of God. Someone sound the alarm if it's not happening. We're not here to play church or keep ourselves occupied. It really is about more and better. And here's number three. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray for God to continue to do his growing here at East Bay Calvary. Let's pray for God's blessing. Jesus said, you know, um, look out there, folks. Look at that harvest. Look at all of the need. And he, and he said, you know what we need to do? We need to pray that God sends laborers. And then Jesus kind of tricked them because the very next verse he says, so go out there and do it. They didn't realize they were praying for themselves. We need to pray. It's his kingdom. But God, please do it here and please use us. And put a fire in, in me to be all about this. And not to get so preoccupied with everything else that's out there, but to truly be about more and better. So would you do that with me? Would you stand with me? I've got three action items, and I really, I want them to go from the page to our heart. That we need to be all in we need to be concerned to the point where we sound the alarm if it's not happening, and we need to pray our guts out. God would do something special in our midst. So pray with me, would you? Make this prayer and make it your own prayer. Well, let's unite on these things. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask and beg you today to keep growing your kingdom. And we're not myopic just to think it's just Traverse City and it's just East Bay. It's more than this. It's more than here and it is abroad. But God, for the glory of Jesus Christ, for the spreading of his fame and renown, God, grow your kingdom. But then even beyond that, Please do it here. God, not for us, not for our recognition, not that anyone would even notice us, but God, may they notice Jesus. May this fire rest within us, Lord, that you would use us as investors and laborers for your kingdom. And bring the birds in, God. Make a nest here for them. And they may not even look like us, and that's fine. But God, please grow the commitment here. For your credit, your glory, your honor. All these Bay Calvary said.